Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, you must want to have a discussion with both of us after this is over, <laughs> uh, given Air Power and Henry Aaron. Um, it, it turns out that um, uh, Brooks Claver and I actually have more in common. I was born in Trenton, New Jersey, although I was raised in the South and have lived most of my life in the South, but I also got my doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm beginning to wonder about this connection that I didn't know about. Um, but without further ado, let's turn to the topic. And uh, I might entitle my part of it. Jeff is going to talk to you about some of the spectacular achievements that African-American soldiers did in the First World War. I'm going to set the scene with their overall experience. And I might entitle my part of it, Only America Left Her Negro Troops Behind and you will see why that is the case, the African-American military experience in the First World War. First of all, you have to remember that only the Army would even consider having black Americans in combat in the First World War. The Navy had relegated all of them to mess men, and the Marines, by 1798 decree, were lily white and would remain so. But there were some 380,000 black soldiers in the First World War. Oddly enough, when we understand that most of them, other than 40-some thousand, most of them will be stevedores, pioneers and engineers, in other words, uh, basically troops that work behind the lines, and 40,000, 42,000 will be combat soldiers. Uh, General Tasker H. Bliss in 1917, who was assistant to the Army Chief of Staff, and he would later be the wartime Chief of Staff in Washington, believed, quote, that Negroes seemed to take naturally to military service. Um, there is the, what's called the Fort Des Moines uh, uh, major experiment where you're going to have a thousand educated black men and some 250 um, non-coms uh, trained to be commissioned officers. And in, at the beginning of 1917, Bliss said very simply, we should be able to raise some 16 regiments of black soldiers, which meant four divisions. Um, although he realized that white Southerners might recoil at this prospect of training black men to arms. Well, in fact, it wasn't just white Southerners. Some of Bliss's colleagues felt the same way. Uh, but the perfect example is the rabidly racist Senator James K. Vardaman of Mississippi, who opposed the use of African Americans in combat and said, by training Negro soldiers to defend the nation, he feared, it is but a short step to the conclusion that his political rights must be respected even though it is necessary for him to give his life in defense of these rights. Um, and you at once create a problem far-reaching and momentous in character. That's the direct challenge. If you train black soldiers to fight, they will upset racial segregation and the Jim Crow society of the time. And he knows that African Americans from the other angle of thinking, yes, this is the way we prove that we merit equal rights. And the French would call this l'impôt de sang, the blood tax. In other words, you're willing to shed your blood for the country. If you do, you should be a fully equal citizen. Well, that's why the Army relegates most of its African-American soldiers to labor troops. That way, they're not in combat. But Furthermore, one of the reasons we don't get those four divisions is because of what happens on August 23, 1917, when part of the 24th Infantry Regiment, 24th Infantry Black Regiment in Houston, mutinied at their treatment and the treatment of the black citizens. Uh, the response is quick. Uh, 19 of them will be hung. Um, the racists use this. Um, riot as an excuse to question the reliability of black soldiers. Um, black Americans were very upset with what had happened, and so then they were subject to questions of their loyalty, 
And although the NAACP wanted more black soldiers in combat, in the end, the decision was there would be one division of four regiments which would receive minimal training before it went overseas. That will be the 92nd Division. Of course, the Army firmly believes that any unit of black soldiers has to have white officers because blacks are not capable of leading or leading themselves. Um, in fact, uh, the most scandalous aspect of this time was when Lieutenant Colonel Charles Young, senior black officer in the US Army, um, was basically invalided out for medical reasons. They took him out. Um, of course, Lieutenant Colonel Young actually rode his horse from Ohio all the way to Washington, D.C. in 1917 to demonstrate that he was perfectly fit. My father, who was a seven-year-old at that time, remembered that. He said every black person in this country was following Young's ride. And it didn't make any difference, because the fundamental point was that no black man could give a white man orders. That was going to be the standard throughout the Second World War until after the Second World War and the integration of the Army. Now, but there is another division, the 93rd Provisional Division, which happens to be created on basically an ad hoc basis because you have four volunteer units and there's one that's actually a drafty unit that you don't know what to do with. The first one is the 15th New York National Guard. They will become the so-called Harlem Hellfighters as, as we refer to them as the Harlem uh, Rattlers because they always call themselves Rattlers as we'll see. They will become the 369th Infantry Regiment. The second set is the 8th Illinois National Guard, which has actually had served, it's formed earlier, it served uh, the Spanish-American War, it served on the Mexican border. Um, its fundamental problem will be, as far as the Army is concerned, it is black, all black, from colonel, commanding colonel, to the lowliest private. And they don't know what to do with that kind of a unit. In other words, you just can't have that. And so they're going to have to struggle with how to handle it. The 371st is basically, oddly enough, a, a regiment of South Carolina draftees. And they were de designated for labor duties and somehow got thrown into this mix um, at the last second. And then the 372nd, as it will be, is a composite of black National Guard units all the way from Massachusetts to Tennessee. They will form the 93rd Provisional Division, a division which existed only on paper, never was pulled together, and they will be parceled out to French divisions. Now, the 15th New York is the first one to go. Um, they tried to belong to divisions in this country. They applied to the New York National Guard 6th Division. They applied to the Rainbow Division, the 42nd. The 42nd and the 6th refused to admit it. The 42nd replied that the grounds were that, quote, black is not a color of the rainbow. Well, there's only a problem then. That is neither is white. So <laughs> where, do you, where do you get off with that? That's one of the biggest jokes of all time. So that really doesn't work. They just didn't want any black soldiers. This is a social issue, everything else. They're not going to include them. So because the 15th experiences so much difficulty in the states, they try to train them in Spartanburg, their potential of race riots. They ship off and arrive in France in January 1st, 1918. And their commander, who had been a member of the Nebraska National Guard, Colonel William Hayward, being Bill, as he was known, you know, football and baseball star at Nebraska, taught by uh, none other than Pershing in his ROTC classes. Uh, he has no problem with black soldiers. In fact, he's convinced that these soldiers are going to be an elite regiment, as are the rest of his officers, many of whom, most of whom are white, but they come from privileged uh, 
families in, primarily in the Northeast, and he has five black officers, cap, two captains, three lieutenants, one of whom is the aptly named for this war, Napoleon Bonaparte Marshall, um, who is a captain, but he's also a famous black lawyer um, and uh, Harvard graduate, uh, Harvard track star, Harvard law degree. Um, they get to France, but nobody knows what Hayward doesn't know is that they're destined to be labor troops. But the deus ex machina appears, none other than <coughs> General Philippe Pétain, commander of the French forces on the Western Front. Pétain knows that the 15th has arrived. He knows there are three other unattached regiments and he approaches Pershing and he says, um, I would like those black soldiers. They won't give me any white soldiers. Give me the black soldiers. Pershing, a little discussion, and he says, all right, fine, you may have them. On January 11th, 1918, Pétain gratefully accepts the black regiments as infantry, combat soldiers and agrees to supply them with French rifles and equipment. The 15th only discovers this the 369th when it arrives in the French army. It never called itself the 369th. They never called themselves the Harlem Hellfighters. They called themselves the Rattlers. Don't tread on me. Look at the shoulder patch. That's where that comes from. It completed its training, the 369th completed its training so well with the French they go in March. By April, they are in the front lines, and they are doing very well. In fact, Hamilton Fish, um, who was a sign of a famous New York family, a Harvard All-American lineman, a future New York congressman, says to his father, writes him, I am a great believer in the fighting quality of the educated American Negro, provided he's well led. If the regiment does not make a splendid record, it will be the fault of the officers. Please remember that. It will be the fault of the officers if it doesn't make a tremendous record. Well, Fish need, have not, need not have worried. It does. And Jeff will talk to you about how first heroes, Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts. And their exploit, when it hits the news, nobody realized there was even a black regiment in the lines at the time. They're stunned, and uh, it explodes into the press. Pershing mentions them in his first communique. They fought so well that the French army turns to Pershing and asks him to give them not only the three other black regiments, they ask to give him, will he give them the 92nd Division too? How different the history of the 92nd might have been if they had gone to serve in the French army. Pershing does not give them up. Well, at this point, the other regiments, the 70th, 370th, 371st, 372nd are arriving. They will all be in the line, in the front lines by August of 1918. And they are going to do well. But there's a problem. The American Expeditionary Force Headquarters is determined to impose an all-white officer cadre on these regiments, especially above the rank of captain. And uh, they have administrative control of the regiments. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, some French officers, even American officers, say this is going to ruin the morale if you do this. The AEF does not care about the morale of black soldiers. It imposes that. It whitens the uh, officer cadre of the 369th. And as it does, it sends it officers from southern backgrounds. And that's a bad mix. It's one thing when they like to tell people that southern white men can handle southern Negroes. Southern white men are terrified of northern Negroes and it's going to cause all sorts of problems, but we won't get into that. Um, what the American Expeditionary Force then does in August is to try to get the regiments back 
from the French army. Now they're in the army, they're in the front lines, they're fighting, and uh, Pershing suggests that uh, they need to come back and be labor troops in the American Expeditionary Force. Um, well, the French Colonel Louis Lenard, who is the uh, chief of mission at uh, AEF headquarters, tries to prevent this by telling French officers uh, not to treat black officers as equals and definitely try to keep the men away from, from French in public, especially French women, uh, because this undermines, and he puts it very bluntly, this undermines the inexorable segregation in the United States. Um, in the end, it goes up to Ferdinand Foch, who's the Allied commander in chief, and Foch replies bluntly to Pershing that the loss of four regiments in the French army would cause the deletion of two combat divisions. He considers uh, the absence of uh, some labor troops for Pershing to be a minor issue compared to that, and replies, you'll get them back after the war is over. And so he sends them back in December of 1918. Um, all of them are going to fight well in the the regiments of the 93rd and the climactic offensives at the end of the war. The 369th, the 371st, the 372nd. In fact, the 369th is going to do this spectacular offensive where they seize um, in the face of tremendous German uh, defense, uh, achieve the capture of the village of Seychelles. Um, they will lose half their complement of men in the two weeks' time uh, of that period of the uh, Mers Argonne Offensive. And it's fascinating because Captain Lewis Shaw, who was a decorated white officer of the regiment, observes, our colored boys have made a lasting name for themselves. They fought and won magnificently. My company kept going under its non-coms even after all the officers were gone. In other words, what the 369th demonstrated was that if you expect your men to do well, they will. And they don't need white leadership to ensure that, because what Shaw is basically saying is all his men, his officers, and he himself are down. All these units are going to receive um, decorations. Individuals, the 369th is going to get the, uh, basically the Croix de Guerre for its band on its colors. Um, the only one that has problems being integrated, an interesting term, into the French army is the 370th, the Chicago. Because what do you have to do? First of all, you've got to get rid of its uh, lieutenant colonel. And they do that by saying, he's got medical problems, just like Charles Young. Somehow all these guys, black guys, when they become lieutenant colonels, uh, they get medical problems suddenly, and they've got to be moved out. And what ends up happening to the 370th is that although it serves very well with the 59th Division and actually is able to take under black officers, black captains, some positions that the French army could not take, it actually will serve in battalion strength split up with the various regiments of the 59th Division, French 59th. The 92nd is a different story altogether. Pershing, its commanding officer, Balu, threatens it with disbandment if it engages in racial conflict or rape. Well, African Americans have always got to be my, a minority in any camp. When it hits France, it hits France late. It hits France relatively untrained. It enters combat uh, in the Argonne um, in October, and unfortunately, two of the three battalions of the 368th Regiment collapsed on 28th of September. The division command blames this on black officers. It's not black officers, it's all the officers, because please remember that the commanders of the battalions are white. But somehow it's just the black soldiers that do this. Uh, the commander of the Second Army in which the 92nd Division is uh, Alabamian General Robert Lee Bullard. And um, 
after that, as far as bullets is concerned, black soldiers and particular officers can do nothing right. His, the chief of staff of the uh, 92nd Division was a Tennessean, sometimes called a Georgian. I don't know where we need to place him, but he's a southerner, Colonel Allen Greer. His statements, all black company officers are incompetent, need to be replaced by whites. The 368th failed in all its missions. Actually, what happened was two battalions collapsed. The third battalion took the position. Black soldiers and rank cowards, they basically do nothing but rape, shoot each other accidentally, murder one another. He concluded that the men could do anything but fight. They have, in fact, been dangerous to no one except themselves and French women. And as for colored officers, they exercise no control, and they are just plain liars in addition. Point. Greer insisted that the Army, should the Army ever consider having black officers and soldiers in the regular peacetime Army, it needed to talk to Southern military types like himself. You see what the issue is here. You're trying to weed all the black officers and men out of the Army as it's demobilized and make it all white again, if that's possible, except for the four regiments that have been left in the States. Uh, Bullard echoes those things, basically says, if you need combat soldiers, don't put your time upon Negroes. But there's one man in the Army, a black man, Major Walter Loving, who's the black agent in the military intelligence branch, who on 6 May 1919 gets so outraged at what's going on that he writes this memo to them damning the quality of the division's white officers in their pronouncements. Greer specifically, um, he says, should be court-martialed because instead of working zealously for the success of the regiment, he's spending all his time demeaning and denigrating it. And Loving echoes what Hamilton Fish said. If the division was not a success, then the fault rests with the division commander and his field officers and not with his men. Well, those are all false and exaggerated tales. One man was found guilty out of 28,000 in court martial. One man was court martialed for rape. Um, the other key is to get these black soldiers out of France as quickly as possible because they're afraid that there may be race riots between white soldiers and black soldiers over French women. But the greater fear is that the French will side with the black soldiers, uh, which will then lead to tremendous unrest, uh, unrest. But what you can see is that this objective is to get black men out of the army. And Southerners are now demanding, like Vardaman, that these French women ruined soldiers be brought back and somehow made to be unassuming and modest. And so the army sends Robert Usa Moton to France to tell these black soldiers, please be good when you get back to the States, which just angers them even more. Um, so what you find is that if you read books by historians Chad Williams and Robert Farrell, and Farrell deals with the 92nd, he said, the, no wonder these black soldiers are angry. The division's commanders hadn't prepared them for combat. When they did well, it didn't make any difference because they didn't relentlessly attack their manhood, honor, courage, and intelligence. And they judged the division, which did perfectly fine in combat afterwards, on the performance of two battalions on that first day. It just so happens that my great uncle, who won the Distinguished Service Cross in the Croix de Guerre in the first uh, World War, was in the 369th and won his Distinguished Service Cross on that first day of combat. So. Uh, 368, so it's one of those situations that uh, I still chuckle at. My great uncle didn't appreciate it. Um, the 369th was fortunate. It had officers that supported it. Um, some soldiers returned radicalized. It's worth it to note that there will be 19 black soldiers lynched in America when they come home. Um, French military attache Louis Collaget condemns this whole thing. Um, but the 
the word is out. General George Marshall firmly believes that black soldiers are cowards, especially at night, which seems to be peculiar because the men that Jeff will be talking about and so much of the combat in the First World War before the final battles. This is trench warfare, it's most vicious, and it's all at night. And this is where these men rack up these medals and honors fighting at night. So how in the devil, well, we know how because I have a War College memorandum. Here we are at the War College, memorandum 1925, and I'm going to end on this note very quickly. The Negro, particularly officer, failed in the First World War. Mm. That's not correct. Cordae, in fact, said they didn't have to be defended from anybody. They had done well, especially those. We understand that the Negro is, by nature, subservient, believes himself to be inferior to white men. He is most susceptible to the influence of crowd psychology. He cannot control himself in the face of danger to the extent the white man can. He has not the initiative and resourcefulness of the white man. He is mentally inferior to the white man. His brain is smaller than that of the white man. It weighs 36 ounces compared to 45 for the white man. God, oh, damn. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, but here we do find that um, oh, all officers believe the Negro is a rank coward in the dark. Somebody should have told Henry Johnson and some of these other guys that. His fear of the unknown and unseen will prevent him from ever operating as an individual scout with success. Um, it goes on and on and on. They do qualify something occasionally. It does say, hmm, they did creditable service as combat troops to the French. But according to reports, we're not as efficient as our white troops nor the French. They apparently never read the French reports because uh, the French reports don't say that. And finally, they go through the set of uh, regiments. And it's an odd thing that when you go through the set of regiments, there's one regiment missing in here. And it's the 369th. Everyone else, all the other regiments are commanded by regular army officers who all have the same ax to grind. Hayward never believed that. And so it's as though the 369th never existed. And the title comes from the fact that of all the soldiers that fought in the First World War, when the victory parade is held in July 1919 in Paris, everyone's soldiers are there, all colors, races, ethnic groups, except African-Americans, because they've all been shipped home early, except for one group, and those are the grave diggers who are going to dig up the men who have been buried and rebury them in American cemeteries. Thank you. Good job. It's always a hard act to follow. Oh, and he's famous for his punchline, so I'm going to have to, to uh, give him one of my own. Uh, a little embellishment, maybe not embellishment, development of the Charles Young story. Uh, I had always thought that he simply rode from um, Ohio to Washington. The story is that he alternated between riding and walking in order to give his horse uh, a rest. And when he arrived in Washington, the military authorities told him, you only prove one thing, and that the horse was fit, not you. So that's a little bit of a development of the Charles Young uh, story. Um, some people, based on the Army War College report, which basically formalizes, codifies, institutionalizes, validates, uh, all of that garbage from Bullard and Greer um, that people, black people are asking or telling themselves, we did all this thinking that we were going to get full citizenship, and what did we get out of it? Well, William Pickens, who was a contemporary, leading contemporary scholar and activist, NAACP field secretary, 
actually has an answer that a lot of people don't consider and need to consider, and it's something that I always tell my students. And Pickens says, the war made clear to all, especially blacks, that character is more fundamental than reputation. Reputation is something that is imposed from the outside. Character comes from within. And the character of black Americans shown clearly in the light of war caused by the all-exposing fires of a burning world. Suddenly, according to Pickens, the most undesirable element in the United States became the most reliable element. Who did Woodrow Wilson call out to guard the White House during the emergence of the war? He called out a battalion of so-called colored DC National Guardsmen. That the war, according to Pickens, had allowed blacks from Africa and America the opportunity to make their first great record as a modern international factor and a positive world influence. And that was a lesson never to be lost on blacks. So out of World War I came a self-confident new Negro who helped lead the long and difficult campaign for justice and equality, not yet won. So World War I was not a waste because black people did, they saw, they could not have that taken away from them. So here we see on the screen, you know, everybody knows about John McRae's iconic in Flanders Fields. And I put the, the manuscript, the handwritten version up to show you, you know, what came from the man himself who would not long after die uh, in World War I. And I think you can read that. So I won't read it, but I will read the poem by Andy Raza Kerfereko, better known as Andy Rofska, who would be a Harlem Renaissance figure, um, writer, uh, musician, composer, work with Fats Waller, so we would consider him a member of the new Negro intelligentsia. But here he is speaking to the new Negro on the ground, the sort of mass new Negro, the ones who would be uh, at war in Chicago, in Tulsa, and other places where blacks are being attacked. And he offers his version of In Flanders Fields, assisted by Albert Smith, Albert Alex Smith, who was a member of the Pioneer uh, Infantry, which is uh, represented there. And Andy Roska, in Flanders fields where poppies blow beneath the crosses, row on row, we blacks an endless vigil keep. Yeah, we though dead can never sleep. Ingratitude has made it so. Why are we here? Why did we go from loving homes that need us so? Was it for naught we gave our lives on Flanders fields? Ye blacks who live, to you we throw the torch. Be yours to face the foe at home and ever hold it high. Fight for the things for which we die, that we may sleep where poppies grow in Flanders fields. So it is a call for black people to take up the fight uh, that had been waged by uh, these brave soldiers. And so we have the Pioneer Infantry represented, the 15th New York National Guard, which would become the 369th, the 367th, which is a regiment in the 92nd Division. It's hard to read, but next to that is the SOS, Service of Supplies, the Labor Troops, and of course, the 8th Illinois, which would become the 370th uh, Regiment in the 93rd Division, known as the Black Devils. And then at the back, ASC, Amer Army Sanitation Corps. 
the ones who were really doing the dirty work. And it's also indicated in some places that the pioneers were part of that graves registration service um, that was responsible for the exhumation of uh, dead soldiers uh, to be reburied in American cemeteries. Uh, in any event, um, you can see that this is a very, very uh, sort of dark uh, and uh, uh, representation and also an angry one uh, and a pleading one at the same time of the black soldier. Well, Andy and John referenced uh, this uh, don't tread on me and the icon of the 15th New York National Guard was the rattlesnake. Uh, how did it get that, by the way? This is something I'm, I'm continuing to learn. Uh, people have come to me with uh, information, with questions, and um, these lectures help me, and John has certainly done some new research uh, to come up with the lecture that he did tonight. Uh, but I'm giving a lecture on George uh, Robb um, and uh, at the World War I uh, Memorial Museum in Kansas City at the end of the month. And I went through the George Robb collection at the uh, Kansas State Archives. And he has a tremendous personal collection, but collection of his service uh, in the regiment and also about the regiment. I'm going to speak more about uh, George Robb uh, shortly, a white lieutenant who was the only Medal of Honor recipient uh, from the 369th uh, during World War I until June 2nd of 2015 when Henry Johnson, uh, who John referenced, became uh, the second uh, member of the 369th to receive the Medal of Honor and the second black period from all of World War I to receive the Medal of Honor, and I'll speak about that uh, as, as well. But uh, how did the Rattler icon, or I, we couldn't you know, pin down when uh, they became known as the Rattlers, when that rattlesnake the, from the Gadsden flag uh, became uh, you know, uh, their, their icon, their symbol, their insignia. Well, as it turns out, and John probably knows this better than I, the French didn't have markings on their, uh, you know, that the indicated unit numbers on their, uh, or unit affiliation in a clear way on their wagons and trains. So uh, Colonel Hayward uh, said, we've got to have something and uh, to, to designate uh, ours. Uh, and someone came up with the idea of the rattlesnake and there it was, and it was sometime in uh, April of 1918 that they adopted the rattlesnake uh, as the symbol. Well, Andy Ravzov, who wrote that uh, riff on McRae's uh, In Flanders Fields, actually wrote a poem about the 369th or the 15th. He wrote, there is a wondrous symbol which has come from across the sea it's worn by every member of the 15th Infantry. A snake curled up, prepared to strike, and one can plainly see that by its threatening attitude it says, don't tread on me. O oh race, make this your battle cry. Engrave it on your heart. It's time for us to do or die to play a bolder part. For the blood you've spilled in France, you must and will be free. From now on, let us advance with this, don't tread on me. And uh, so, you know, part of the write-up about this talk is how was the, how were the members of the uh, Amer uh, African American members of the military inspirational uh, in terms of the civil rights movement? We can see how someone like Andy Roscoff is encouraging people to follow their example to build uh, upon it. Although we find, and John has hinted at this. Uh, that the members of the 15th slash 369th did not become radicalized like uh, many other soldiers did because they seem to have received much different treatment because of their early placement with the French and also their relationship with their National Guard uh, officers. And we also find that when 
substitute or replacement officers come to the regiment, many of them Southern, uh, that there are problems. Uh, and in fact, one of these officers kills uh, one of the uh, very popular members of uh, the regiment. So why am I going to talk about George Robb uh, tonight? What I found in George Robb's I also found his personnel file, which is a rarity. As many of you know, there was a fire in 1973 at the Federal Military Records Center, which destroyed 80% of the uh, personnel records there. Uh, so if one can find a file that's intact, and the other thing is that many of them were damaged by not only the fire, but by water, I saw a message that don't try to separate these pages because there's mold, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Rob's file was remarkably intact. Rob being, as I indicated before, at the time, the only uh, member of the regiment to receive the uh, Medal of Honor. So what Rob's file um, revealed accidentally uh, was that there was another member of the 369th who had been recommended for a Medal of Honor. And that is William A. Butler of uh, Salisbury, uh, Maryland, originally from White Plains, Maryland, sometimes confused with White Plains, New York, and official documents and even someone has White Plains, Illinois. But we see there that, that William Butler has a distinguished service cross, a croix de guerre with palm, which is by order of the army, which is the highest level of the uh, croix de guerre, and a regimental croix de guerre uh, as, as well. Well, didn't I say that William Butler According to George Robb, some document in George Robb's file was recommended for the Medal of Honor. Well, what happened? It's not the actual recommendation, but there's an index sheet that indicates that William Butler was recommended for the Medal of Honor on November 18, 1918, at the same time as George Robb. George Robb gets it becomes one of Pershing's 100 heroes of the war, and William Butler receives the Distinguished Service Cross. Well, 95 black soldiers received the Distinguished Service Cross in World War I. So where is the Army War College report with all these cowards and Bullard and Greer are saying, right? And I've also seen that a number of uh, whites who were recommended for the DSC were downgraded. So it's a significant honor. Believe me, it's the second highest, right, for enlisted man. There were 6,430 Distinguished Service Crosses awarded in World War I. 96 Medal of Honor recipients. So we can see how, in terms of quantity, how much more valuable the Medal of Honor is. It puts these men in a totally different category. We don't remember who received a Distinguished Service Cross, but we'll often remember Audie Murphy or Sergeant Alvin York, right? Men who received a Medal of Honor. And it's a brotherhood, and there was not going to be any blacks and that brother, because they couldn't possibly do the denial thing that they were doing in these reports and in these uh, malicious, libelous statements. Right? So George Robb is speaking to us from the grave about William A. Butler. He does more than that. In Robb's personal papers, we find that he liked to give speeches. Rob was trained as a historian. He received a master's degree at Columbia University under William Dunning. 
And anybody knows William Dunning is like one of the leaders of the dark and bloody school of history. Uh, uh, Reconstruction historiography, right? A Southern kind of mentality. In any event, Rob gave a lecture in 1937 to the Topeka Saturday Night Literary Club. And he tried to be even-handed and points to the gentle nature of blacks, but also cites their arrested development as a result of capture, forced removal, and enslavement without explicit mention of those things. He seems to accept the curse of Ham and the lasting stigmatization resulting from it. He also notes that Peter Salem killed Major Pitcairn at Lexington and Concord with a gun, then slyly adds evidently the razor as a weapon of offense and defense had not come into its own during the war. Then he goes on to discuss black participation in every war, and refers to blacks as Sambo in quotations. He gives the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry high marks. And he said the 24th deserved more credit in the charge up San Juan Hill than Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And he notes the positive effect, however, of the careful placement of white officers in these units. Then he focuses on black officers in World War I and repeats the dominant stereotypes. One of the failings of the colored man seems to be that he does not know how to handle authority. It has a tendency to go to his head with the result that he loses confidence and respect of his own people. He tells of the 368th being thrown in without any time in a quiet sector before it went to the front. Then blacks joined white-led units and performed admirably under white officers. The fact remains, according to Rob, that the Negro does not make a good leader of his own under fire. The black man has been filled full of the idea of race equality, but the going, when the going gets tough, he instinctively looks to and leans on his white brother. So we can see how pervasive this whole mentality is within the American military. This guy from Kansas who was trained at Fort Sheridan, who finished in the bottom third of his class there, has all this to say about blacks. He says the history of the 369th reads like a comic novel, but he gives them much credit for their performance. And he says no platoon or company ever broke never lost a foot of ground or a man to capture. And then he talks about their unrivaled skill in rolling the bones. All right, so he invokes these stereotypes of the blacks, the bones being dice, of course. And dark humor is always the best way to relate to and hold a white audience, all right? His hostility against the West, uh, Eastern elites shone through, yet he seemed to have aspired to it as he had an Ivy League degree, albeit a master's, and not from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, known in the regiment as the club, but from Columbia. He cites the pedigree of the officers as the main reason why the unit did not end up as a pioneer or labor unit, and also bought into the narrative that the regiment was simply a political creation designed to boost the profiles and electability of the governor and its colonel. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he said that Colonel William Hayward fashioned himself as the next Theodore Roosevelt, that where Theodore Roosevelt had the Rough Riders that helped to propel him into the presidency, uh, uh, that Hayward had the same uh, delusions uh, of grandeur uh, with uh, the 15th. Then he talked about blacks as a group. And it must remember that the great mass of our colored citizens are still of the same mentality as Nigger Jim of Huck Finn or the Wildcat of Octavius Roy Cohn fame. Do not do the black man the injustice of judging him by yourself. Then he cites an example of a white officer who promised blacks aboard a ship that it would not sink because of his white lily talisman. And Rob tells us he must have been a Southerner, at least a good judge of colored nature. 
And of course, this white officer was supported by this black soldier who had a rabbit's foot. So with the white lily and the rabbit's foot, there's no way the ship could be sunk by a submarine. And he also says that the Negro has a lively imagination, that he is very impressionable. A black man loves flattery. And whatever's faults, though, May, what those faults may be when in mass, when cornered, the colored soldier is a dangerous adversary. And then he tells the story of Needham Roberts and Henry Johnson. So why am I talking to you about all of that? How does it relate to what he had to say about Butler? So he says all these things about blacks as a group, as soldiers, but then he has these remarkable things to say about William Butler. And also about things like the Army War College report. Following the war, in the press, I've read many statements of two different kinds concerning colored troops. One kind of statement was to the effect that the Negro was the greatest fighting soldier in Europe. Such statements, of course, were wild exaggerations. The other kind of statement were to the effect that the Negro as a soldier was a complete failure and that not a single instance of Negro heroism in the war could be cited. Such statements were a vicious libel on a worthy people. Let me give you one example for which I can vouch. And this is going to have to serve for what I'm going to say about William Butler. I have the Quad Aguerre report. I have some other uh, statements, in fact, an affidavit from the lieutenant uh, whom Butler uh, saved. But I'm going to let George Robb speak for what Butler did this fateful night of August 18th, uh, 1918. All right. If I remember our infantry drill regulations or other army manuals I have read, there is a statement to the effect that the highest quality of a soldier is to be able to think fast in any emergency and act. In other words, when faced suddenly with a grave problem, to be able to solve it and solve it now. That holds true whether it be John J. Pershing leading the army or the humblest private in the rear ranks. A company of the 1st Battalion, actually he's wrong, was a 3rd Battalion uh, because Butler was in Company L of the 369th was holding a frontline sector on the Champagne Front in August 1918. The country had been fought over for years and old trenches ran in every direction. Because of continued shelling, the trenches were wide at the top and shell fire had long since demolished all wire entanglements. The immediate front line was held sparsely by points made up of three or four men, possibly 100 yards apart. A colored sergeant with two men equipped with a French light machine gun known as a chauchat, they're stationed at a point where a communicating trench came from the rear, out uh, cut the French trench line, and wandered off into no man's land. The chauchat is fed by half moon clips holding 24 shells. When in action, it rests on a tripod and is fired by a man lying on his stomach or kneeling. It was never intended to be fired from the shoulder, and a Frenchman would have fainted to have seen it so handled. The show shot was cordially hated by American soldiers because he could not hit anything with it at a distance, but at reasonably close range, it was a murderous weapon. One morning just before dawn, a party of Germans came over on a quiet raid. They slipped through between the outpost and somewhere behind the front line picked up a white lieutenant. The white lieutenant was actually crouching, shooting uh, flares, because the, the guard said he had heard something. And a German soldier puts his hands on his shoulders and tells him to move. Can you imagine what that American lieutenant must have done in his pants at that point in time? In any event, uh, they did not take the time even to remove the lieutenant's hat, but with his hands in the air, started him up the communicating trench, which was guarded from the front by the Shoshat crew. As dawn was breaking, and it's not true, this was at 3 a.m., so it wasn't dawn, the colored sergeant heard a noise behind him, and turning, 
he saw coming up the trench from the rear, scarcely 10 paces away, the officer with his hands in the air and followed by some dozen Germans. There is your emergency. There is your problem. It drops on you out of a clear sky and you have about 10 seconds in which to act. Think it over and decide what you're going to do about it. But the 10 seconds are gone and you're dead or a prisoner headed for the German lines. Here's what that burly colored sergeant did. Without a second's hesitation, he whirled, grabbed up a, the so show shot, whirled again, and threw it to his shoulder, at the same time shouting at the lieutenant to jump. The lieutenant, fearing the deadly weapon in front more than the Germans behind, threw himself against the side of the trench, and as he cleared the Germans, the sergeant cut loose with the show shot and mowed down the line of Germans like so much chaff. And in less than 10 seconds, the emergency was over, and the problem solved. When, can you cite, when you can cite me a better example of quick thinking and prompt effective action on the part of a soldier, I would like to hear it. All right? So John and I have always believed when we started this project and saw what William Butler had done that he was perhaps more than anyone in the regiment deserving of the Medal of Honor. And there's, he's also taking fire, which is not mentioned in, in this. He had also done something heroic on August 11th of 1918. He was wounded at Seychelles. He took gas uh, in another uh, battle. Uh, and be, because he took his mask off to be able to communicate to his, his, his men. So we are working with some uh, pretty powerful people to try to have William Butler reconsider for Medal of Honor. And I'm going to end the talk there. Sorry that I uh, went so long. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. We've got time for uh, just a few questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, we've Thank got you. one to start right here. Could you give us some uh, some understanding of how uh, exclusively black units were raised? I mean, where did they come from? How were they uh, how were they mustered? And what was the uh, what was the impetus to form a black an exclusively black unit? Thank you for that question. It, I, you know, I did forget one thing, and I, I'm going to answer your question. I mentioned that that uh, 95 blacks received the DSC. What we didn't know, and recent research has uncovered, is that at least, we believe, eight blacks were recommended for the Medal of Honor. And four of those came from the 370th, by the way. So I'm gonna answer your question because the 370th is the regiment that was National Guard officered by blacks from the top down. We know that two of the soldiers recommended for the Medal of Honor were from the 371st, Stowers and Burton Holmes. Burton Holmes got the DSC, so he was downgraded. For some reason, Steady, Freddie Stowers' uh, recommendation or, uh, was not processed, and he didn't get anything. And that's one reason why he ended up getting the, D, uh, the Medal of Honor. But let me get back to your, your, uh, your, your uh, question. Uh, in 1878, the 8th Illinois was formed because blacks had this historic relationship with the military. Uh, from, you know, the, Re the Revolutionary War, Jackson had them in, in New Orleans. Um, uh, Civil War, blacks are trying to, and in fact, New York had three black units come out of the uh, state, but none of them recognized by the state of New York. They were privately raised by, with help from the Union League Club, uh, which was a big supporter of, of Lincoln and, and the Union. But it was this feeling among blacks that if we're not represented in the military, we can't possibly be seen as first-class citizens. They understood the importance of the militia to, and the citizen soldier to, being a, a, an, an American. So um, there are recruitment efforts, uh, political people have to be brought on board if they're going to be recognized by the state. Remember, Chicago, Illinois gets its eighth 
It is actually called the 9th Battalion first, and it became the 8th uh, Illinois Regiment later because there was already a 9th Regiment. In 1878, right, New York doesn't get its Black National Guard unit until 1916, and the deal is that the commander has to be white, and uh, Major uh, General John O'Ryan, who was the commander of the New York National Guard, actually believed that there would be no white black officers uh, in the unit eventually with the new uh, standards brought on by the 1916 uh, uh, Militia uh, Act. Uh, so, uh, and then of course those officers are removed during uh, the war. Um, and uh, so it's really about a, a tradition and a recognition that you can't be uh, a full-fledged American without military service participation. Simple two-part question. The first one is that we had, uh, in World War I, the U.S. forces had a pride in saying that only U.S. forces served under uh, U.S. control, except for the 92nd and 93rd. How do they go about, uh, how they how proceed within the actual organization of the uh, African-American units at that time? How do they feel about being special or set apart? The other part is that uh, for World War II, we heard about the black press, how it would monitor and transmit again the activities and the, uh, the uh, kind of the uh, performance of black soldiers back into the society, how that happened in World War II, in World War I. Um, first of all, there are two white divisions, the 27th and the 30th, that and are right. echelons with, hmm? And some others. Some others, but they are echelon with the British and Australians in the First World War. But that, in fact, uh, like one of them is the 6th New York National Guard. Um, and so Pershing does let some of them serve with other units. Uh, for those African Americans who serve with the French, um, I don't think there's any doubt that they felt better treated. In fact, if you look at the perfect example, uh, 95, 96 Distinguished Service Crosses, 75 of them come from the 93rd Division, only 20 from the other, from the 92nd. So it means, and in fact, the French um, and people like Hayward are really intent on trying to get African-American soldiers the medals that they deserve. And you find this correspondence back and forth uh, between the French and the Americans, and the French are complaining about the American administration delaying the awards of medals to black soldiers and trying to get them to delay, and they feel these men should be receiving the decorations at the same rate that their French soldiers that these men are serving with. So it is, uh, shall we say, it's a dangerous one, but it's a blessing. If you've got to be a combat soldier, you need to be echelon to the French army because uh, they do accept you, and the people behind the lines um, are willing to accept you in ways that simply doesn't happen. Um, and of course, the blessing is also that if you're not in the 92nd and you're not with the Americans, you don't have white Southerners running around telling the natives that you have a tail, um, et cetera, et cetera, which went on in World War II. My uncle was a World, was a World War II veteran. So th this is endemic. Um, and the black press and the white press do trumpet the achievements of Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts. Uh, the black press actually calls for equality um, as uh, it will do with the double V in World War II. So you see the genesis of this in World War I, but what happens is that the military intelligence department cracks down on the black press and tries to muzzle them in World War I. Um, that's the result of saying these things. So there's a price to be paid. Yeah, the most outspoken black journalist, and we didn't do very much with him, is Ralph Tyler. Um, and I think he focused more on the Chicago, I don't see any writings by him about the 369th, but he's someone to look at. We have time for one more question right here. We, we have an executive privilege question, too. Right? Okay, so we'll let him go out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I was just curious what happened to the lineage of these units after the war? Did they continue to go on or disbanded after the war? Ooh, that's, uh, that's something I, well, uh, yeah, uh, the 369, well, the War Department wanted to remove blacks from the role as combat soldiers, so there was a, a movement to, to have them become pioneers. Uh, someone said that the pioneers did the work that the uh, engineers were too lazy to do and the infantry too proud to do neither fish nor fowl. So they're put in really dangerous positions and without any way of defending themselves, essentially. So, and then they talked about reorganizing the National Guard and having sort of like a national or regional black National Guard because they didn't want to put national, black National Guard units within the state National Guard. So 369th was actually decommissioned after the war. It didn't come back into a federal recognition until 1924, uh, and it, but the New York had the, the 15th New York Guard, which was a home guard, and many of the men from the 369th who were from the New York area came back and served in the 15th New York Guard until it became uh, a National Guard uh, unit again. I'm not sure what happened to the, uh, you know, when the the 370th also was reconstituted, uh, but I don't know their history uh, as nearly as, as, as well. Um, so those would be the two main National Guard units. The, the ones in the 372nd, there was no regiment. There were battalions and companies, et cetera, that were in the 370th. And both divisions, the 92nd and 93rd, really don't exist between the wars, but are resurrected in World War II sea service towards the end of the war, almost the same thing that had happened in World War I. And you can understand why, once you've seen that 1925 memorandum and you've seen the attitudes of people like George C. Marshall, it's like beginning from scratch again, although black people realize they've achieved things. Uh, there is no recognition on the part of the military. And before World War II, the 369th became an anti air a coastal anti-aircraft artillery unit because those could be placed like the black platoons, I guess, in Bastogne, uh, 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 you know, in sort of reserve. They didn't have to be integrated into a unit. So that was the only way the, the unit was going to continue as a combat uh, unit was to take that role. Then it became transportation, all kinds of other things uh, uh, more recently. It still exists, but it's, you know, a shell of its former self. I was an Army stevedore, and even in the 70s, the stevedore units were disproportionately black uh, compared to the general population of the Army. But the lore uh, in those units was that in World War I, the services of supply, the stevedore units, were constantly trying to volunteer to go to combat. Uh, was, if you base it on the, the concept of the blood tax, that the only way you get credibility is, uh, and equality is to shed blood. Uh, was that really uh, uh, widespread in the service units, uh, the sense of uh, the only way we're gonna get recognition is uh, to die in combat? Um, I'd say yes, because one of the things that uh, I've noted and I've seen some of the comments from the pioneers and uh, as well as what they call the engineer units, and the one thing one of these fellows actually was quoted as saying, he said, the one thing we regretted was that we were never able to enter combat against the Germans. That's what we really wanted to be able to do. Some of these units are actually armed behind the front, but they can't fight. And so they might be shelled by the Germans where they are, but they'll never come to grips with them. So I think that's actually rather widespread um, because there's a sense that you will be ignored. Uh, it's worth it to note that the supply units are really the great enablers of the military. You can't go anywhere without logistics and supply, but at the same time, uh, if you want to be recognized and also to get equality of uh, citizenship, you, there's the sense you have to serve. 
Well, we, we also, I'm sorry, just as one point, we didn't make the point that needs to be made that most blacks who served in the United States military in World War I did not go overseas. They were in labor camps at home. 